Today's talk continues the six part series that will last uh, on and off into February on the evolution of the wordless singing known as nigun, a musical form whose early history is located in the emergence of Hasidism as we learned last week from Michael Lukan. And it has become one of the most recognizable and distinctly Jewish musical traditions. We're lucky today to have with us Professor Anna Sternschus, who is beaming in to us from the University of Toronto, where she directs the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies, hello, and serves as the Al and Malka Green Professor of Yiddish Studies. Her research and publications uh, have been recognized internationally and amply um, in the area of Jewish culture in Russia and the Soviet Union, including oral history and Yiddish music. In addition to the couple of dozen articles she's published on Soviet Jews during World War II, Russian Jewish culture and post-Soviet Jewish diaspora, she also serves as co-editor-in-chief of East European Jewish Affairs, which is the leading journal in this field, um, and is the author of two books, Soviet and Kosher, Jewish Popular Culture in the Soviet Union, 1923 to 1939, and When Sonia Met Boris, An Oral History of Jewish Life Under Stalin. She's also the recipient of several awards, including a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship. And the topic we'll hear about today um, is connected to her most recent project called Yiddish Glory, The Lost Songs of World War II, which has received widespread acclaim, including a 2019 Grammy nomination. Um, which is something that I don't often get to say when I'm introducing scholars. So um, please help me welcome Professor Anna Strenches. Thank you, Anne, for this wonderful introduction. And it's so great to be uh, sort of in person, but you know, at least virtually at the Cut Center. I have wonderful, wonderful memories of being there as a fellow in 2001, uh, which really launched my career uh, for years to come. And uh, the interactions with fellows and uh, with the members of the community and students uh, have been crucial. And I always think of that center as uh, the model for invigorating uh, scholarship making institutions. I'm very excited to be back and talk about this project. I feel a little guilty that, you know, in the project of this, the series devoted to Nigunim, I actually will talk about some pieces that have words, but I cleared it for the boss. So hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully you will stay and listen about that despite uh, that circumstance, but I will show you some uh, maybe pieces that... <clears throat> will be of interest. So, okay, so I will share my presentation and then just uh, start talking about that. So our story begins uh, about 27 years ago when the librarians of the Ukrainian National Library found uh, a number of boxes in a basement of the previously restricted section of the library, which contained handwritten Yiddish documents that looked something like that. After some time, it was understood that what they found were the documents were part of the archive uh, created by Soviet Jewish ethnomusicologist Moisey Berigovsky uh, and his colleague, a linguist Ruvim Lerner, that uh, and their team, um, workers who worked at the special department of the Ukrainian Academy of Science called Cabinets for Studies of Jewish Culture. And the team of Berigovsky, led by Berigovsky, spent World War II um, looking for and recording and writing down the words of songs and also other forms of folklore, jokes, short stories from Jews who were living and dying uh, in the borders of the Soviet Union during World War II. So um, after they had finished this project, they were going to uh, publish it in a book and uh, do more research in it. Um, they collected um, thousands of songs uh, between 1943 and uh, 1947, but the institute, that department where they worked, was shut down by Stalin's government in 1949. Berigovsky was arrested, so was Ruvim Lerner, and that's why the only photograph I have of him is this mugshot taken uh, when he was arrested by Stalin's government for conducting this uh, project. 
Uh, and that to give you the scope of how of what they worked on um, is that of six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust, about uh, two and a half million were killed within the Soviet borders of 1941, which of course includes. Uh, um, parts of eastern poland and uh, uh, baltic states that became uh, that came under the soviet annexation between 1939 and 40 so berigovsky learner and a number of other colleagues spent world war ii trying to uh, write down uh, music documenting atrocities that were going on with soviet jews as they unfolded so they've um, collected um they, they began this project uh, on trains. Uh, in 1941, Soviet government launched a special evacuation project that evacuated uh, a number of strategically important industries to the Soviet rear. Uh, for example, metal making, weapon making industries. Among those, they considered academics and uh, uh, and uh, scholars and also producers of cultures, uh, people who does, who needed to be evacuated. And that's how Berigovsky and Lerner and a few others ended on those trains. The trains also carried refugees who ran from uh, Eastern Poland and uh, Baltic states to the Soviet rear right after the German invasion. Um, and uh, when they were on these trains, they had their pens and papers out and people were sitting in those cattle cars, sometimes with no chairs and, and no places to sit and were sometimes singing. Uh, and uh, Barry Goski and Lerner were recording these pieces. And these are some of the first songs we have, uh, music of the Holocaust, depicting um, experiences of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. And pieces like this are in that archive. But um, the scholars came back to Kiev in, um, 19, in early 1944. And very soon after that, they launched expeditions to parts of Ukraine that were just liberated by the Red Army after the war and were looking for survivors. Initially, they were hoping to record uh, uh, stories of the survivors, how they made it, who saved them, what it was like for them to be uh, in those ghettos uh, in the Transnistria area of Ukraine that was under the Romanian occupation um, during World War II. But people were extremely afraid to talk to them, uh, partially because the Soviet government was not exactly looking super favorably at Jewish survivors or anyone who survived the war under the German occupation. Those people were suspected of being somehow uh, untrustworthy or maybe collaborating with the German or Romanian government too much. So Jews who survived the Holocaust within the Soviet borders were most often interrogated, sometimes arrested and even sent to jail for surviving. So a lot of survivors uh, just lied about what happened to them during the war. Many said that they were evacuated uh, to the Soviet rear. Others uh, uh, came up with different stories. So, uh, but what they could do is uh, they had less worries about performing music uh, and uh, singing songs. And uh, at some point, Berigovsky had a brilliant approach. And, uh, you know, when he was getting nowhere, when talking to, with adults, he started asking children uh, whether they knew any songs. And kids instructed by their parents to say that they survived the war somewhere in Central Asia or away from Ukraine, uh, were willing to sing songs. And when Berigovsky was saying, oh, wow, you have such a beautiful voice. Where did you learn that music? Uh, kids would say, well, I learned it when I was here in the ghetto. And that's how uh, the team was able to record hundreds of original Yiddish uh, uh, songs that circulated in a number of ghettos in Transnistria, especially Bershid Ghetto, one of the largest uh, um, ghettos of that region. At some point, they had 20 to 25,000 uh, prisoners. Um, and uh, one of the uh, um, one of the uh, um, no, Berigovsky and the, you know, maybe I should show you his photo. Uh, Berigovsky kept very detailed notes on what he encountered during those expeditions. And uh, one of the things that he wrote uh, in his diary, ethnographer's diary, was that um, the places that they visited seemed 
empty to him. So for example, they went to Kiev for, right, you know, uh, they returned in 1944. This is how Kiev looked like in 1945. And the word in Yiddish that he used in those notes most often was pust. That word in means in Yiddish the same as it means in Russian, empty. And uh, uh, empty, uh, what did it mean, empty? Of course, Kiev and uh, other areas of Ukraine that they went to uh, study were not empty. They were full with people. It's just that they were empty of Jews. And um, people who Berigovsky encountered and were asking to sing and record their music were uh, weak traumatized, shell-shocked, discouraged, uh, both by what was going on with them during the war, but also about all the challenges that they encountered after the war, when they came back to Ukraine that was not exactly welcoming to them. A lot of people experienced a discrimination. They couldn't find housing. They were kicked out of their housing. Government officials refused to help them. So the joy of survival was also accompanied by the devastation of how the neighbors were not happy to see them. So in addition to this feeling of emptiness, another uh, kind of key word that Berigovsky spoke about was this sound of silence. Um, he Before the war, he was really interested in klezmer music. In fact, I don't know if everyone knows here, well, except for uh, Dr. Lukin, who maybe is here on the call, I don't know. But Berigovsky record, uh, defended uh, a dissertation, doctoral dissertation on klezmer music in Moscow Conservatorium in 1943. To my knowledge, this was the first uh, dissertation in a field of Jewish music recorded, uh, defended anywhere else in the world. And thinking of that as being defended in Moscow in 1943 is really something. I think the next dissertation on klezmer music was defended by Han Kosnetsky in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 1978 in Boston Conservatory. So anyway, I'm saying all this because Berigovsky was really interested in Jewish instrumental music. He, uh, before the war, he <clears throat> put together a collection of that, uh, one of them was published. He was also doing songs with words, but instrumental music was really his passion. His dissertation was about this. He was writing about Doina. <clears throat> and its rhymes and all that. So it he was really into that. Um, and when he came back to Ukraine, the sounds of Jewish instrumental music were just disappearing. Like, for example, Bela Tserkov, uh, one of the uh, centers for Jewish instrumental music, uh, before the war, they had a number of music schools, a very strong klezmer tradition going there. But Bela Tserkov Jews were almost entirely killed during World War II. This, you know, Bela Tserkov was under the German occupation, and they were almost no Jewish survivors, minus a few kids who were hidden by locals. So um, some of the, the most songs that he recorded after the war were sang by amateur performers who could barely carry a tune, but instrumentalists were very, very rare to encounter. So, but, so when he was able to find something, he was very excited and was writing all these things down and the notes of that are in the archive. So for example, uh, one of the uh, uh, tunes that he was able to cite, read uh, from what he heard and later arrange a little bit, I'm showing it on the screen for you. Uh, you know, he called it in his notes, Partisan Lova, uh, written down from uh, uh, an anonymous musician in 1946 and a lot of this stuff in the archive is anonymous and but at least it has notes so um i want to give you a sense of how uh this um, music sound in a second but uh i one more point i want to make before you enjoy uh the performance is berigovsky was really invested and interested in having those music the one that he recorded the right after the war to be performed on stage. And uh, he was writing to composers and to his colleagues and uh, asking them to adopt those tunes for public performances. Um, and he had zero luck almost. Uh, he write, wrote, for example, to Dmitry Shostakovich, asking him to work with this material. Shostakovich refused to say that the artistic level of this um, 
music is quite low and uh, it's not possible to kind of work it for stage. Other composers either didn't want to work on that or um, were afraid because uh, doing public performances of Jewish music in the Soviet Union of 1946 or 47, especially 48, was not exactly um uh, was not exactly not dangerous exercise. So this tune le stayed in the archive up until uh, last year uh, when Canadian cellist and composer Beth Silver uh, took it, arranged it for cello and uh, performed it on video. So I'm going to play that for you. And this is how it, um, this is a tune that survived in that archive called Partisan Lyoba. <laughs> Thank you, Beth Silver. Um, as you see, the arrangement of that music uh, stayed more or less true to the original, as far as uh, we could tell. Um, though I called it Klasmer, of course, uh, is that does not sound exactly like Klasmer. And Berigovsky wrote quite a bit about how this music has to be relying on Bartok and uh, kind of these ways of interpreting. And uh, Beth did a little bit of that and also brought her own vision to uh, to that tune. <clears throat> so um, now I want to show you some of the materials that other materials that Berigovsky found. Uh, the rest of my presentation will have to do with songs that actually had lyrics. And as I said, the majority of those were uh, sang, performed by amateur uh people singers so, or artists uh, also the words were written by amateur poets and um they turned to music not because necessarily they were 
um, interested in making musical products, uh, but they turned to music because they had no other choice. Many of them wanted to document what was going on with them, talk about what they experienced, what they felt, uh, living uh, in ghettos, experiencing death of their loved ones, coming very close to death themselves, but they lacked capacity to tell the story in a coherent way with the beginning, middle, and the end, uh, or uh, tell the story in a way that will be clear to the listener. So a lot of people who wanted to talk about experiences, emotions turned to music. They relied on existing tunes that they knew, popular songs, often songs from films, tunes that they liked, folk tunes, or um, or again, the music written by professional composers, changed the words a little bit and made them into products that talked about their experiences. So, um, and a lot of this music was recorded from Berigovsky, by Berigovsky from children. So uh, his first expedition was to the city of Chernovitz. I showed it on a photo for you in uh, a photo taken in 1945. Chernovitz um, was uh, a city where a lot of Jewish um, survivors from uh, Transnistria ended up in. Uh, Romanian uh, Jews, for example, that were deported from uh, their homes to uh, ghettos in Bershot and Shargarot and the other in Pechora, in um, um, in Otolchin, in Transnistria, uh, uh, came back uh, there and they came. They they stayed uh, in Chernovitz, waiting what will happen to them. Romanian Jews were allowed to leave the Soviet Union right after the war. Also, Ukrainian Jews often did not want to stay where the ghetto was or even come back to their smaller towns before they were deported together because everything was destroyed and uh, they had nowhere to come back to. And uh, a lot of people went to Chernovitz. In fact, there were so many Jewish survivors in Chernovitz at that time that they organized two Jewish schools there, one for boys and one for girls. Each one had between seven and 800 students. And this is where Berigovsky found many of his informants. He would go to those schools and uh, ask those kids to sing uh, songs for them. Now, if we talk about ghetto of Bershad, I already mentioned it. Uh, it's uh, one of the largest ghettos in Transnistria. It had um, at some point between 20 and 25,000 prisoners. Majority of people who died in Bershad died from cold weather and diseases. And they were survivors as well. And um, uh, people who were in that uh, Bershad ghetto often, it turns out, enjoyed music written by one of the uh, survivors of uh, uh, Bershid Ghetto, Boris Zitzerman, who was a young man at that time, only 14 or 15 years old, when uh, he ended up in Ghetto of Bershid. He, he's from there as well. And uh, he wrote a number of songs, uh, a number of poems that people then set to music, and that music circulated in Ghettos of Bershid. Uh, he later survived the, the war uh, right after uh, being liberated from Ghetto of Bershid, he served in the Red Army. Um, and then he had the small notebook with all these texts that he created in Bershid Ghetto. When he immigrated to Israel uh, sometime in the early 2000s, his wife made him throw out that notebook with texts. Uh, and I only know this because his son, Yefim uh, Alexander Zitzerman, became a performer of Yiddish music in Moscow. He's still doing that, although now I think he lives in Israel. So, um, you know, the notebook disappeared. But the texts of the song survived in that Berigovsky archive. And that was, uh, he, it seems that this uh, person who was only 14 to 17 years old in ghetto was managed to create texts that really resonated with people. Why am I saying this? Because when Berigovsky came to that uh, school in uh, Chernovitz, uh, here he encountered a number of kids who survived Bereshit Ghetto and they sang songs for him. So this particular song that I'm about to show you called Trees Shake and They Wail and Burn um, was recorded from at least four different children in um, uh, from who survived the one Bereshit Ghetto. Uh, the tune of it, it borrows quite a bit from cantorial tradition, you will see. And um, it talks about experiences in uh, uh, in that ghetto. So let me show you some words for it. I will. You can uh, read as you uh, listen to me speak. Um, 
the um, other thing that I want to say about the song, as you read that, um, there are about um, there's a, about uh, uh, I want to say 150 survivor testimonies from Ghetto of Bershet that are recorded by the Shoah Foundation, Spielberg Foundation in uh, uh, Los Angeles. And uh, uh, these interviews were conducted in the 1990s uh, in Russian, Ukrainian, Romanian, Hebrew, and Yiddish. And um, uh, a lot of people in those testimonies speak of songs that circulated in Bershid Ghetto. And some of them, at least six of them, uh, remembered a song. And uh, this was the song that you're about to read and hear. And they remembered a little piece of sometimes the beginning, for example, what you're reading right now, or especially this part about uh, the song that complained to God about having no mercy and about looking at Jews from up high. People remember this verse, but this one about dying little children, this is something that stuck in memory of a lot of interviewees, even as late as 1990s. And importantly, people who were uh, deported to Bershit from uh, Bessarabia and Bukovina, and also people who were local Ukrainian Jews. The relationship between those groups were very difficult, but both of them uh, remembered those words. And sometimes, and a lot of people cried uh, when they told these words to the interviewer, and a lot of them cried for the first time during the entire interview when they remembered this particular piece. So uh, speaking about death of children, speaking about starvation uh, that uh, they experienced, again, having a lot of anger at God. And what you're reading now is a refrain to that song that talks about uh, <clears throat> God not having mercy and allowing those little children to be ripped from their mother's um breast um and uh, the violence towards uh, older people and Jews with beards and uh, all that um now it mentions specific elements of uh uh, experiences of Bershit. So, for example, all these kolkhoze, the collective farms uh, uh, that um, were now that uh, were the form of agriculture before the war uh, and after and during the war were, of course, uh, uh, abandoned or taken over by the Romanian army or by Germans. And now those fields that gave life to crops are filled with dead uh, Jewish people lying around. Uh, the song also comments on the mass deaths of Bershed and also the fact that people were not buried in cemetery, but were instead uh, uh, you know, buried in mass graves. And even that process was very difficult when people died in Bershed ghetto. Sometimes it took five to seven days to remove the bodies and the, the dead lived with living for quite a long time. Um, and the uh, encounter with that violence was one of the strongest impressions that people had. And a lot of those who were interviewed also wrote memoirs about ghetto, say that no piece of information about Bershed Ghetto expressed it better than this song that you're reading on your screen right now. Um, also, I want to point out to this specific line that you see on the screen, Jews lie around like dogs. A lot of that perhaps came from Nazi imagery, uh, Yiddish um, culture of the time incorporated a little bit or sometimes a lot of Nazi imagery of Jews and uh, translated that as a uh, language of Jews suffering during the um, war. Um, well, I guess, uh, uh, you know, the last verse of the song, please to God to stop the slaughter and uh, uh, finish all that violence. And uh, you will see, <clears throat> as you listen to the song in a second, that uh, there is a lot of anger at God, but there is also something absent. And what's absent is the actual enemy. We don't see a German, we don't see a Nazi, we don't see even a local guard mentioned in the song. The song talks about Jewish life, or rather death, in that place as um, 
as a divine punishment, something uh, that I will discuss in a minute, but I want you to listen to this tune first. This is, and you can read the words as um, the uh, song goes. The tune is original. This is exactly how it was found in the archive. And the vocalist on this uh, tune is uh, Simon Spira, who is an accomplished performer of Yiddish music from Toronto and also cantor himself. So, uh, and I think to my knowledge, actually, it's the first time this song is being performed ever. So it's like a world premiere for you. Es räuschen die Bäume, es flackert, es brennt. Es walgen sich jeden von mäderische Hand. Oi, wei, oi, und wie as oi. Favos schweigst du, Gott, eine Juhi, oi. Wab schön nach. Auf deine jüdische Kapik und stell schon auf die Schritte und so schon sein genießt. Kleinige Kinderlech von jener Zeit. They whine, they cry, they never feel so high. Me wellen sich banugen ne, mit a klein stickle breit, ob nicht zu sehen, dem schrecklichen Tod. Oi we oi und wieder so. Favos schweigst du, Gott, ein Juhi. Oi, hopp schon nach, ach, nur es regnet ja durch ein Boi. Kleininke Kinderlech von dem Mannes Brüste. Me hat sie, me bracht sie, me warf sie auf den Mist. Hoi, altinke, jeder Lech mit der Grube Bär. Me hat sie, me bracht sie, me warf sie zu der Rät. Hoi, wei, oi, und wie hast du? Favos schweigst du, Gott, ein Juhi, Juhi. Oi, hab schon nach, nur bis Rieja, du Neu. Auf die Wege von der Kolchosen Ohne mit uns Salger in sich jeden Me weiß nicht wie sie kämen um Auf den jüdischen Beis-Eulern Blut a kalter Wind Salger in sich jeden Als oi wie die Hütt Oi we oi Ohne wie ja so Favos schweigst du, Gott in you, ai, ai. Ui, ob schon nach, ach, nur wenn es regnet, ja, du in dir. Und ich bin ich im Abblick, auf deine Jüge. 
you can clap for Simon Spira if you want um, for this beautiful performance of this uh, uh, song. I also want to say um, that this song is probably written in 1942, which seemed like the most hopeless time in Beershit Ghetto. Red Army was nowhere near close. The deaths were mounting and uh, the song was the pinnacle of that hopelessness that the no end is coming and um, no end to suffering is coming and um, it's uh, and this, it's um, you know it makes sense it was popular in 1942 what is also interesting to think about is that why it made so much sense in 1940 five and i think it's because at that time jews especially those who were in ukraine not um, in soviet parts of ukraine were experiencing quite a bit of devastation themselves in other words uh, all these difficulties that i talked about were very much there and they come back to a very different soviet union the one not that they left not the one that uh, you know uh, punished people for expressing anti-Semitic sentiments, not the one that uh, granted them equal rights. This is the beginning of their life in the country that uh, 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 that uh, brought systematic discrimination against them. So the song resonated also with this kind of hopelessness that a lot of and people felt and also allowed them to grieve for those uh, family members who did not um, make it. Now, I also want to say that Berikovsky and, <coughs> excuse me, his colleagues did not exactly work in the atmosphere of, I don't know, academic freedom, that they could record, oh, sorry, uh, all the music that they uh, wanted um, during this uh, time. Uh, they... Uh, in fact, the process of recording probably went through triple censorship uh, because at first people who they interviewed had to think whether or not they should say something. Uh, second, the scholars who are writing the words down of the music that they encounter had to decide whether it's uh, good enough to uh, be a, a put on paper. In other words, is it not defeating any of the Soviet uh, norms? Or is it they're doing anything anti-Soviet? Is it talking specifically, for example, about Jewish suffering as opposed to universal suffering? That was a big no-no uh, for the Soviet um, a climate of the time. And if you want in QA, I can ad address that as well. And then, of course, after that, there's also a process of what exactly are you writing down. So maybe you write down the words, but then you correct some of the statements that uh, you know seem not possible. So uh of course, these texts that survive, they are the products of that triple censorship, but still they give us a sense of what mattered and what people understood, at least at the time when they were creating this. Uh, products. So one last thing that I will show you from this archive is this song um, uh, called uh, Hitler's uh, Defeat, Mapola. And uh, uh, the story of that song is uh, as follows. Um, when uh, Berigovsky came back to Kiev, he was quite involved with the outreach programming of that Cabinet for Studies of Jewish Culture, kind of like cut centers doing outreach uh, programming, open, opening those uh, academic lectures to the general public and to students. So they were trying to do that in that Cabinet for Studies of Jewish Culture. And um, the most popular genre of those events were lecture concerts uh, and also writers reading. So one of the people who attended this event was uh, um, a man named uh, Itzik Ingber. Before the war, he was a cantor. Long before the war, his father was a cantor and all this. He was uh, uh, related to the whole large family of uh, Soviet Jewish composers, the Nayevskis and all this. So um, anyway, so he came to this event and he was like, well, I've heard some songs from people who, um, you know, either survived the war in evacuation or served in the army. And we have this little synagogue in Berdichev that's not really a synagogue. We meet in somebody's house. And uh, he suggested to Berigovsky that he himself is going to write down some of the tunes, some of the words that they are singing in Berdichev, you know, in 1946, 47. And I do want to say that Berdichev was 
was such an important center for Jewish culture before the war. You know, Levitz, von Berdichev, Hasidic center. Even during Soviet times, at least 40, maybe percent of Berdichev was Jewish. And the survival rate of Jews who one British of 1941 was close to zero. The ghetto in, the, in British of existed only for 10 days. They rounded people all up, killed them, and that was it. Among those killed in British of was uh, Vasily Grossman's mother. Uh, Vasily Grossman was a Russian writer of uh, the novel, who authored the novel Life and Fate. And um, you know, thinking of Berdichev as a place where there is some sort of Yiddish music, uh, cantorial even music, or at least music relying on Jewish religious tradition in 1946 or 47 is quite moving. So thanks to that work of this volunteer work of this Itzik Ingber, Ingber, we got some of these samples of that music. So quite different in um, style and in the message compared to the one that I just showed you, because of course it talks about victory, it talks about survival, and it also talks about anger. But of course, this anger is directed not at um, uh, God, but directed at Hitler. And Hitler and the Haman, the villain that wanted to kill Jews during the uh, holiday of Purim, uh, you know, the one with, who we remember during Purim, of course, those are the words used interchangeably. And these are the, these are the lyrics that uh, talk about uh, how Jews uh, succeeded. The war against Hitler um, ended with the death of Hitler. It calls for people to be joyous and uh, celebrates the downfall of Hitler and, of course, celebrates Stalin. One of the, um, you know, one of the things in this material is that uh, there was not enough Stalin praise in that. So Berigovsky uh, added some of that uh, into the texts in order to have this uh, material, you know, at least potentially be publishable, but uh, it didn't help at the end. But some of the Stalin is there quite naturally. There's a lot of uh, um, the lot of texts that uh, that uh, compare him to a god, to Messiah, to ultimately a Jewish savior. And of course, it's uh, important to think about uh, how that seemed relevant and right in 1944 and 45. And of course, in 1947, Stalin turned against Jews and uh, launched one of the most cruel anti-Semitic campaigns uh, in Soviet uh, history that uh, took lives uh, of Jewish intellectuals uh, and uh, stopped Jewish productivity and Jewish scholarship in the Soviet Union up until really 1989. But in these songs, this is the moment of history when people celebrate Stalin in Yiddish, in those, uh, uh, using those Jewish terms of reference. So now I will, oh, I hope I can play it for you. And if I can't, that will be really um, sad. Just give me one second. Okay, Mazel Tov. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hitler had given all the Yiddel of Humbringen. Hoys ran in the fund der Welt. Stalin and Fariden got up and gain. Kein schon mal's Käufen for Geld. Se verkehrt die Schöne, rode ma Paul allein, a Schöne, rein, a Kapore. Far dem klois roll. Freizeh jeden Tanzt was dich her Sei zu Frieden Erschein sich her 
Hitler od ima pole, Stalin od ima mašale, se farson ima behala, farina rafala. Mazel tov! So that was the performance of uh, vocalist Psoj Korolenko and uh, on uh, violin, Sergei Yardenko, um, uh, Roma inspired performer from uh, Russia who worked together on uh, uh, arranging this tune for us. So um, a few things I wanted to say now, I don't have nothing else to share you, so I'll just say a few words of conclusion. And that is to say what, uh, one of the things that we learned from this material is um, uh, the music um, created this testimony that of violence, of emotion, that people felt and experienced during the time as the war unfolded. It spoke about things that mattered to them, that made sense, but also some of the things that didn't age very well. So for example, there's a lot of anger in this music. There is a lot of anger at God. There's a lot of anger at Germans. There's a lot of anger at local collaborators. I didn't show you all this stuff, but you know, this is my observations from analyzing this material. And uh, a lot of that anger is associated with revenge, which is very strongly motivated in this music. It mattered in 1945 and 46. Soon after the war, the idea of revenge uh, disappeared from Jewish public sphere. Instead, started, you know, the idea of never again became much more prominent uh, in the 70s. And this idea of how does one continue living among other people became much more important than the idea of how do we revenge for the death of others. So also the music's praise for Joseph Stalin, uh, of course, did not age very well. The music's uh, reliance on Soviet terrorism and talking about the heroism of Red Army, once again, did not age super well. And that's why in so many ways, the archive was obscured, of course, by its history because it was uh, uh, arrested when Berigovsky was arrested, but it's also obscured by the how dated and how um, hard it is to translate the sentiment of this music for today's audience. But what it does give us a chance to know, to think about is what uh, gave people comfort and what gave them entertainment and what um, gave them a sense of community when they listened and performed this music during the darkest moment of their lives. And I think that um, um, this uh, opens all sorts of answers to that question. Um, and another thing is that a lot of those musicians, including, uh, or artists, including Yefim Z um, Zitzerman, who wrote the song that uh, Simon Spira sang for you, he was dreaming that this music will get to be performed on stage. Dreaming for, for a long time, never got to see a lot of that music performed on stage. And uh, the fact that you were here to, today with me uh, this afternoon and listened to his music and listened to he, that story, uh, this is uh, something that people who created this music really wanted. And I wanted to thank you for your attention tonight, uh, for your attention this um, uh, afternoon. And uh, I'm concluding now. Thank you again. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Anna. It's so evocative and so powerful, especially to listen to the contrast between the incredibly despairing song at the worst moment to the joyful celebratory song at the end. Um, I really appreciate that. So um, we do have some questions. Uh, I want to start um, by asking a little bit about the setting inside the ghetto, what times and places, what contexts in which these these compositions would have been either written or performed and shared. So are we talking about organized musical like gatherings, performances? Are these more like tunes that someone would sing and hear and then sing while laboring or something like, can you just describe the social context? Sure, thank you. So uh, a number of social contexts. One is some, like Get of Beershit, for example, had um, a Jewish community council like Judenrat. And they um, tried to run a number of uh, events, but it was not like uh, Ghetto Vilna or Ghetto Warsaw, where they actually had theater in the concert hall and stuff like this. Um, as far as I could tell, 
uh, organized uh, li a cultural life like this in ghetto of Bershek was not really possible. So the context was different. A, people got gathered in somebody else's room, sometimes the room of the poet or the room, like they didn't have their own room, but they had space where they lived with other people. And it was very cold, so they sat together. And to entertain themselves, they played cards, and sometimes they sang those songs. And uh, we have testimonies from the Spielberg Foundation, from Mogilov Podolsky Ghetto, for example, where that um, author, Relly Bly, she was there with her son, who two years old boy, and when son went to sleep, she was uh, reciting poems of all these teenagers. She was a teacher before the war; she was thirty, uh, you know. Get her, and then she created all this music, and these teenagers learned all this stuff by heart. And sometimes they set it to music, so that comes from that. <laughs> In Ber Get of Bershit, very similar. Uh, rooms of other people. Another big context for this music is begging. Uh, a lot of kids supported themselves by, you know, walking around, sometimes even in Ukrainian villages. But, you know, but in Ghetto, for sure, they sang in Yiddish to provoke pity. We have a lot of songs like that. Um, there are also a number of lullabies uh, that um, emerge from ghetto repertoire. So we can imagine either they were sang privately or by, you know, uh, people putting kids to sleep or they were sang in a context. Uh, another thing I want to say that some of this music was recorded after the war and uh, the ethnographic notes say that uh, they were again recorded in this inside the closed doors and but for different reasons so uh, a lot of uh, people in Kiev for example Jews who came back to Kiev in 1945 uh, realized that all their family members are in Babi Yar and there was no context for them to commemorate their mem uh, their lives because um, the Soviets refused to talk about Holocaust as a specific event that attacked Jews so people sat in their each other's apartments Saturday nights and sang music with saying things sometimes didn't sing just like spoke things together um kind of like sometimes prayers sometimes just words sometimes they said it to tunes and the, the archive contains some of the transcribing of these rituals so that's the third context that i see um and there are others as well, but, uh, you know, less uh, performative, less kind of theater music, more uh, inside uh, inside consumption. Amazing. Thank you. Um, your comments at the end of that really tied into the next question that I was going to share with you, which is um, coming back to um, what you raised about the climate in which it was frowned upon to speak about particular Jewish suffering. So again, not wanting to talk about the Holocaust as a as a particular um, site of Jewish victimization, but rather the tragedy of the war or victimization of Soviets in general. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. So um, when the survivors, Jewish survivors, came back from wherever they were, either from the serving in the army or surviving in the Soviet rear, they were devastated by uh, their losses. Um, Jews were uh, the only group of the Soviet population, for example, for whom it was safer to serve in the army uh, than to stay under the German occupation. The civilian survival day for Jews under the German occupation was less than 1% in Transnistria, a little between 15 and 20%. So for Jewish men who, I don't know, had guns, who liberated uh, Budapest and Poland from, uh, you know, from the Germans, they come back home and they are, like, they, their wives and their kids are all killed and their parents as well. So that overwhelming guilt uh, and impossibility to move on is what informed a lot of their lives. And um, one thing that a lot of people wanted was to commemorate they're dead. So, for example, a lot of people were killed in mass graves or buried in forests and stuff. So they wanted to set up some sort of monuments for them. That was very difficult. Soviets really didn't want that. And a lot of music of the time talks about how in Yiddish talks about how they died because they were Jewish. They deserve to have a monument that says something in Yiddish about them. And uh, um, a lot of that uh, movement to commemorate the dead, that was, was something that mattered to people. And 
uh, you know, Jews who survived the war in the Soviet Union were very different than those who lived before the war. They were much more assimilated, much more Russian speaking, much better integrated to the Soviet economy. So in other words, Yiddish and Jewish culture and of course Jewish religion were very far from what mattered to them most. And yet commemorating the death of people who, um, you know, were killed during the war was really important to them to do it in a Jewish way. So uh, the con so fight for that, they, they wouldn't fight for a lot of other things like kosher food, no. Uh, I don't know, Jewish rituals, even circumcision was gone. But fighting to keep those graves and to create those graves was really, really important. So this is one context. And another context is uh, severe discrimination that they began to experience. I mean, the veterans, when they came back from the war, they were part of this privileged class of Soviet citizens. You know, they could enter universities without exams. They could live anywhere they wanted, get all these jobs, except if they were Jewish. And especially if they wanted to go in the fields of humanities and international relations, those fields were so desirable because, you know, conversely, people were interested in like, why did all that happen and how can we make sense of it? But those fields were increasingly impossible for Jews to enter. So technical disciplines such as engineering and science and all in physics, especially in chemistry, were open. And there's always this discussion, why are there so many Jewish engineers? Well, it's not because they, you know, they were so necessarily interested in that. Sometimes it was the only path. So I would say that the, the existence of that music you know, from 1943 to 47 gives us a glimpse into this moment before all these Jews really abandoned all the Yiddish and became all these engineers. And also a little bit of voices of people who didn't make it to the end. And the importance of this is, in addition to everything else, is that's really authentic voice. You know, I mean, like, this is how they spoke. This is how they sang. These are the tunes they chose. And these are not necessarily the tunes that we think they should be using. There's a lot of, like, you know, music there that's set to Kazakh tunes. Oh, my God, they love Kazakh music pogrom music they just loved all that and it's like now all jewish so uh, you know it's hard to make sense there are a lot of music set to nazi tunes you know they heard it on the radio they just changed it and made a jewish song like what do you do with all that except for thinking about well this is what made sense to them and we should like probably analyze it somehow the way that deserves rather than you know to apply some other metrics to that that's incredible. That's another thing that I was going to ask you. So now you've answered is so the origins of some of the tunes. That's um, really crazy. Um, we do need to wrap up. I want to ask you one more question and it's connected to um, a few people are asking, like, how can they find more of this music? How can they find right. the performances that you quoted? So I offered in the Q&A to, to list the specifics of what you um, played for us when we post this video online. But also, can you talk about that, but but also a little bit about what kind of musical resurgence or use of this archive is happening now. Like who's picking this up and, and what are people making of it? How do they feel about singing these, these songs at this time? Yeah, well, you know, I've been working with different musicians. I mean, my major partner with this is Soy Korolenko, who sang the Mapola at the end, the downfall of Hitler. And um, he is a... Um, artist and also poet and also a scholar and we worked together on uh, thinking of this music as uh, um, you know as a performative piece and uh, it started with that and we also worked with instrumentalists uh, one major thing that Bergowski wrote in this archive is that this music is not klezmer music so we were not bound by klezmer tradition so uh, people were using all sorts of musical tradition mostly Soviet tradition so Soviet tradition what does it mean music usually from films performed in uh, you know uh, in cinema theaters a lot of composers to that music actually happened to be Jewish too so we're going to count that as Jewish music uh, a little bit uh, but you know sometimes um, so we've been working like we did one CD if people are interested in hearing more of that music we did a CD called Yiddish Glory, The Lost Songs of World War II. If you Google it, you'll find a lot of that. If you put it on YouTube, you'll find a lot of videos with subtitles, which makes it much more interesting to listen because, you know, it's one thing you listen not understanding. It's another thing with subtitles. So that's that. Um, another thing, and then we worked with other artists, performing it for all sorts of different audiences. Um, 
you know, sometimes I get emails from musicians who want to uh, adopt this music, and I'm always excited about this, but then they see, oh, there's all this Stalin in it, and there's all this <laughs> kolkhoza, you know, like all that stuff that doesn't fit, and then, um, you know, they don't know what to do with that, because uh, how, why would one sing about Stalin now without a lecture that accompanies and explains all that? But there is something also about that that material that continues to resonate for different reasons. Like, you know, I was just in Poland um, for work, uh, showing some, doing this lecture concert with Alice Zawatsky, my new collaborator, uh, also a performer and uh, um, a singer and a violinist and also composer. So we did a number of those Yiddish songs for the Polish audience, mostly non-Jews. In fact, I don't think there were any Jews in that audience, mostly young people. And a lot of them from Ukraine because, you know, a lot of Ukrainians left, uh, um, had to flee Ukraine because of Russian invasion. And they were all in tears. Uh, and they were in tears, not because it's a music about Yiddish, uh, uh, you know, speaking survivors or, or the victims of the Holocaust, because it was a music about war-torn Ukraine and uh, the sights and the expression of violence, the hopelessness, the, um, you know, the dead children, all this imagery really resonated with them. And they could they didn't pay attention to all the Jewish references there, you know, the God and all that, but they really... Uh, spoke about how these emotion just spoke to them right now. So it's some interesting ways this music keep finding keeps finding its audience. And um, I really hope that in today's world, you know, when uh, we don't have to do things like explain anti-Semitism to our children, which sadly they you now witness, and all this, I really hope that this material will not become relevant for our life in North America, because that would be very devastating. But I find that it keeps finding its audience that's definitely interested in history and also in what's happening in that region. So who knows? Thank you. That's that's an incredible way for us to finish off this this encounter with this musical archive and, and with your presentation of it. Um, yes, may it be so. And um, I just want to thank you again. This has really been glorious, uh, both the music and the explanation. So I appreciate it. And so do all of the attendees who have been saying nice things in the Q&A. And I want to invite everybody to return um, to, in two weeks on November 28th for Gordon Dale's presentation on um, a European um, uh, Hasidic musician who fled from the Holocaust and brought some uh, European nigunim to America and following the journey of some of these things in a different way out of out of the Holocaust. Um, and uh, wishing safety and good health to everyone out there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Albert, for having me and for giving this opportunity to speak. <laughs>